Um, okay, so thank you very much. We'll pass over to Abuna Suriel to introduce Bishop Yusuf. Thank you, Abuna. Thank you, Ruby. So, Edna, you don't need an introduction, but we're so blessed to have your grace with us tonight. Thank you, Edna, for your time. I just wanted to share with the group um, a bit about his grace, Bishop uh, Yusuf. Bishop Yusuf is a graduate of the Faculty of Medicine. His grace served with dedication and commitment as a servant and a deacon at St. Anthony's Church in Shubra. His grace, Bishop Yusuf, took monastic vows at St. Mary's uh, St. Mary al Suryan Monastery, and Sayyidna was ordained as a general bishop in 1995 by His Holiness Pope Shunuda III of Blessed Memory. And he was enthroned as Bishop Yusuf as the first bishop of the Southern States of America. Under his leadership, the diocese has, gone, has grown and flourished with many churches, fathers, and monastery, theological college and counseling centers. We, we're all used to using the Coptic reader, and we are grateful, Sayyidna, for this invaluable app to your providers with. We thank you, Sayyidna, for your time tonight, and we pray that God speaks through you to make us better parents and spouses. Thank you, Sayyidna, for your time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, one God amen. Uh, I am happy to join all of you uh, tonight in uh, this meeting, uh, your Coptic family. Uh, and uh, I am also happy uh, to reflect on the words of uh, Pope Shenouda, uh, the three common words that he used to mention, uh, God is present or existent among us. Everything has an end and everything works out for good. Tonight we'll speak about the first word, God exists in our families. And definitely God exists in our family and in every uh, family, because God is omnipresent. But sometimes we don't uh, feel his existence among us, not because of his absence, but because our eyes are clouded and uh, spiritually blind. Uh, that's why we cannot feel his existence among us. So the focus of our lecture tonight, actually how uh, we allow the Holy Spirit to open our eyes in order to enjoy uh, God's existence among us in our families. And the key point to experience this is communication with God. And I will speak tonight about communication with God as a family, not as an individual, to experience the existence of God in the family. Actually, communicating with God as a family is called spiritual intimacy. It brings all the members of the family in a strong union together. Building a spiritual intimacy is not easy, but definitely it worth the effort. Why? Because when we communicate with God and we build the spiritual intimacy between all the members of the family, this will help in developing trust, oneness, and closeness. It will be easy to trust one another and to feel the bond of oneness and how we are connected, we are close to each other. And these three things, 
trust, oneness, and closeness are important foundations for a Christian family. Also, when we feel the existence of God among us, definitely this will reduce the conflict. Either we have God in our midst, or we will have the devil, and we give the devil place in our families. Uh, if we don't actually allow God to exist in our families, then the devil will exist and the devil will cause conflict, divisions, and sometimes end in divorce. Uh, communicating with God and developing spiritual intimacy also provide a secure spiritual foundation to the family. We are building our families on rock, not on sand. This spiritual foundation will help the family to be strong during the time of hardships and trials. Also, it strengthens the bond of marriage and strengthens the relationship between parents and children because all of us, we have a shared spiritual focus. All of us, we share the same spiritual focus to glorify God who is in our midst. Having God in our midst and experiencing him also introduces hope and joy into our families. As the Lord told us, and I will see you, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy from you. Feeling the existence of God and experiencing it, develop a home environment where there is safety, peace, love, and forgiveness. We will feel safe because if God is with us, who will be against us? And we'll feel his peace, the peace that surpasses all our understanding. As the Lord told us, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, not as the world it gives do I give you. Also, God is love. And if we have God in our midst, then we will love one another unconditionally, sacrificially, and limitlessly. And having God in our midst will teach us how to forgive one another because we will remember the forgiveness of God on the cross toward each one of us. Also, experiencing the existence of God in our midst establish the groundwork for a spiritual legacy in our families. Uh, so, how, in a practical way, how to experience the existence of God in our midst? We are actually all the time in communication with God. Either God communicates with us or we communicate with him. God communicates with us in different ways. Sometimes we like God to communicate with us in a very strong uh, and uh, manifested way. But this not only this is not, not always the way. When we study the scripture, we saw God several times communicate through silence or through whispering or through shouting. For example, the last verse in Genesis 16, we read that Abraham was 86 
years old. And the following verse, which is seven, Genesis 17, verse 1, we read, And when Abraham was 99 years old, God spoke to him. So between age of 86 and 99, God did not communicate with Abraham. For 13 years, God was silent with Abraham. And when God is silent, sometimes we feel that God is not responding to our prayer. But there is a rule in communication. It says you cannot not communicate. So even when you are silent, you are communicating. So when God was silent these 13 years, he was communicating a message to Abraham because Abraham, when God told him, your children will be like the sand of the sea and the stars of the heaven, he thought about an earthly way to fulfill God's promise by marrying Hagar and having Ishmael from her. That's why God did not communicate for 13 years with Abraham to tell him and to communicate this message. You cannot actually fulfill my promises with earthly wisdom or earthly ways. That's why after 13 years, the first uh, word he told him, walk before me and be perfect. And he told him, by Sarah, you will have a son. So silence, when God is silent, there is a meaning and purpose behind his silence. And also God whispers, in First King chapter 19, when Elijah was afraid from Isabel, and actually he escaped uh, from the face of uh, Isabel. And God actually tried to communicate with uh, Elijah, but Elijah, uh, God said to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12, then God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and a strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. So sometimes we expect God actually to, to shout like in, in, in the strong wind, in the storm, but God was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. And Elijah said, definitely this is God, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. And Elijah said, definitely God is in the fire but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a small, still voice, a still a small voice. And this was God. Here God was whispering. Sometimes we, in order to feel the existence of God in, in, in our midst, we want God to be like earthquake, like storm or fire. Uh, and if God is not working in a very, very uh, manifested way, we doubt his existence among us. But from the story of Elijah, we learn, no, God can be working even if he is whispering. It's like when you are in a plane. If you look at the window, as if the plane is not moving, although the plane actually is moving very, very fast. In the same way, sometimes our perception as if God is not moving, not doing anything, although God is working 
in a very strong way. God wants us when he whispers, he wants us to be able to recognize his voice. Also, sometimes God shouts, either through trials or tribulations or hardships, or to send his voice in a very strong way. He shouted in the story of Jonah. We can see how God communicated with Jonah through the storm, through the whale, through the sailors. So God was shouting in the ears of Jonah. The point I want to uh, make it clear here, many times we want God to be shouting in order to feel his existence and his presence among us. But this is not always the case. As I told you, God sometimes whispers, God sometimes is silent, God sometimes is shouting, but in all these ways, he is communicating a message. And we need to have the trained senses in order to experience his presence among us. That's how God communicates with us. Then how we communicate with God as a family. Again, I'm speaking as a family, not as individuals. This is what we call spiritual exercises or a spiritual canon or a spiritual rule. Uh, the purpose of spiritual exercises is not to spend time with God only, but rather to build a relationship with God. And building this relationship with God is what we call um, spiritual intimacy with God and also makes the presence of God is experienced in a very clear way in the life of the family. Many communicate, but few connect. And this is true about God. Many communicate with God. We see the churches every Sunday is full of worshipers. But how many connect with God? In the story of the woman that had bleeding, many people crowd were around Jesus Christ. But how many connected with God? How many touched him? Only one person who touched him and was able to receive the power of healing. So the spiritual exercise, the main goal of it is not only to communicate, but to connect, to have a strong relationship with God. That's why it has to be in spirit and truth, as the Lord said to the Samaritan woman. The spiritual exercises, it is our response to God's love toward us. Spiritual exercise, it actually produces in us spiritual growth and maturity. And with the spiritual growth and maturity, we will feel God in our midst and we will say, Emmanuel, our God, is now in our midst with the glory of his Father and the Holy Spirit. And as I said before, the presence of God in our midst will give us joy and comfort. And not only will transform the individual, but transform the whole family. As St. Paul said, don't be conformed, but be transformed. I like to speak about some spiritual exercises that we can do as a family together in order to feel and to experience the presence of God. So the cloud that blinds our eye can be removed in order to experience his presence. 
The first exercise is prayer. With prayer, there is fullness, richness, and a depth of intimacy that cannot be achieved otherwise. Intimacy with God and intimacy with one another when we pray together as a family. Prayer cause other areas in the marriage and also in the relationship between parents and children and between siblings to grow into something that can only be orchestrated by God. When as a family approach God, God actually can uh, heal and can connect us together in a very strong way. Every family needs a place where they can come together at one moment in a quiet place, a place where we have one thing in common, and this one thing is God. In prayer, we will find this quiet place. In prayers, our heart will be revealed and will be known. In prayer, we will drop the fake masks that we put on our faces. So when the heart, our hearts are known and our hearts are heard in prayer, intimacy and bond between all the members of the family can be experienced. We have resources of divine grace and love. And these resources are available to each family. These resources of divine grace and love go unused when the family does not include God in the relationship. The only way to have access to the resources of divine grace and love is through prayer. Without God, we are limited to our own human abilities, which usually fail, usually fail. Also, praying together strengthens our commitment to one another. When the family prays together, they are able to claim more promises. For example, the Lord spoke of being present when two or three gather together. And many church fathers said the two or three gather together are the couple and the children. So when we pray as a family, this promise, when the Lord said, if two or together assembled in my name, I be in their midst, we can experience the existence of God in our midst as we pray as a family. Also, the Lord spoke of agreeing together in prayer and how agreeing together in prayer would give greater answers to prayer. So when as a family, we pray together and we agree on one thing, God actually promised us to give us great answer. When God attended the wedding of Ka at Cana of Galilee, uh, St. Mary said to the Lord, they don't have wine. They only have waters, jars of water. Wine and water have representation or they are symbols in marriage. And before I explain the symbols, I like to say that uh, a symbol can refer to contradicting things. It depends on the context. For example, the lion can be a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ, the lion who comes out of the tribe of Judah. But also the lion can, can be a symbol of the devil. As St. Peter said, your enemy is like a roaring lion. So here, depend on the context, 
we have a lion can be a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ or a symbol of the devil. In the same way, water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the living water. But in the context of marriage, water symbolizes the absence of love. As we read in, uh, in uh, Song chapter 8, love is like fire, and water quenched the fire of love. Wine, in the context of marriage, represent love. As we read in Song chapter 1, your love is better than wine. So when St. Mary said to the Lord, they don't have wine, they have water, six jars of water. If we try to read the symbolism here, she's telling him there is no love in this marriage, but there is water. There is everything that can destroy, quench the love in this marriage. With the presence, with the existence of the Lord Jesus Christ, he transformed water into genuine wine. He transformed things that can quench love in the marriage into genuine love, into a happy love, unconditional, sacrificial, limitless love. So the existence of God in the family through prayer will actually transform things that can uh, knock down love in the family into a genuine love, the bond, the Arabi love among all the members of the family. The second spiritual exercise is the scripture. When the family reads the Bible together, they gain new insight into the scripture. As we study the scripture, we discover how God views the world and our role in the world. Many times we find solutions and answers to our issues when we study the scripture together. So we need to spend the time as a family, not only as individuals, to study scripture together. And we will find answers and solution to many situations in our life. The word of God is the safest place to which the whole family should go to be comforted and encouraged. When the Ethiopian eunuch went to Jerusalem, as we read in chapter eight from the book of Acts, he was rejected to enter into the temple of God for two reasons at least, because he is a foreigner and because he is a eunuch. So I'm sure he was sad when he felt rejected and cannot join the people of God in the temple. What did he do? He opened the book of Isaiah and he started reading from the scripture. And God sent to him Philip to interpret the book of Isaiah and to preach him the good news of salvation. And he can join the family of God through baptism. So the word of God is the safest place to which the whole family should go to be comforted and encouraged. When we read the scripture together and we study the scripture together, we will have one mind and one spirit. The scripture also teaches us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. As we read in Psalm 22, verse 3, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. What does this mean? Means if we want the Lord to inhabit our family, to inhabit mean, means to take dwelling, to have dwelling place in our family, to be existent in our family, then a natural ingredient is to worship together to worship together. Worshiping together means to go to the church together 
as a family, at least on the Lord's day. Of course, if more than this will be beautiful, but at least on the Lord's day, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And when we go to worship and praise God, he promised us the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. In the church, the family will connect with the bigger family of God. So the bigger family of God, the people of God, are all the believers. So when we go to the church, we connect with the big, bigger family of God. Also, another sp important spiritual exercise is tithing. To give our tithe to the Lord. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. And as we go to the church to pray, and as we go to the church fasting, the third element beside prayer and fasting is charity. That's why the, St. Paul said on the first day of the week, means on every Sunday, on the Lord's day. Some people, they pay their tithe once a year at the end of the year or once a month. But even if you are doing this, every time you enter the church on the Lord's day, you need actually to pay something. can be very small. Uh, but as the Lord said, don't appear in front of me empty-handed. And St. Paul said on the first day of the week, let each one of you, each one of you, because it is part of the worship. Not only the father, not only the mother, but each one, the father, the mother, each child, uh, should actually pay and, and express his giving to the Lord on the first day. And then St. Paul said, as he may prosper, which means abundantly, with generosity. When we give, the Bible tells us it is more blessed to give than to receive. When we give, we will receive blessing from God. And by receiving the blessing from God, we will feel his existence. And when each member in the family gives, then we will feel the existence of God in our midst. And also, this will train us to be willing to give even our life for the sake of one another and for the sake of God. Another element is fasting together as a family. When we fast together, we strengthen the fasting of each other. That's why communal fasting is very important. And of speaking about communal fasting for the whole family of God, definitely the family fasting together is very important. When Esther went to meet um, the king, she asked her people to fast for her on her behalf. So fasting together increases spiritual intimacy. Also, it enhances each individual's fasting. Church history tells us about the power of fasting together. Fasting together moved a mountain like a mountain in Mu'attam. Fasting together creates a spiritual atmosphere in the whole household. It is a time, we call it time for spiritual storage. We store virtue and store energy and store grace that we can use it the rest of 
the year. Another exercise that will help the family to experience the existence of God is repentance and confession. Especially it's important in the family because repentance and confession is a time to ask forgiveness from one another. Not asking forgiveness from God, but asking forgiveness from one another and seeking reconciliation with one another. It is time to be reconciled in order to be ready uh, for communion. As the Lord told us, if you came to the table of the Lord and you remembered that there is something between you and your brother, leave your offering, go, reconcile first, and then come and offer uh, your worship. Confession and repentance is time to work on our weaknesses, especially the weaknesses that hurt other members in the family. For example, if I have anger or lack of trust or insecurity, many things that actually can hurt other members in the family. Repentance and confession help us to work on these weaknesses. And thus, actually, we will um, be harmless toward one another. It is time to put off the old man with all its works and to put on the new man that's renewed in the image of the creator. This actually leads to the most important uh, exercise in experience, experiencing God existence, which is communion. There is no spiritual intimacy without communion. Our true unity with the Lord and with one another is through the body of the Lord. So in communion, we are one with God and we are one with one another. That's why in the fraction, Abuna actually breaks the body into 13 pieces. The Lord Jesus Christ, the head, and then the 12 pieces represent the church, the body of Christ. So in communion, we are one with God and we are one with one another. In communion, we will feel the existence of God, especially if the whole family goes together and take communion in the same day. It is our opportunity to get rid of our selfishness and our centeredness and to enjoy being part of the whole body of Christ. In, in communion, we turn from individual into just a member. Before communion, we are individual. Individual means non-dividable. Individual, non-dividable. I, I cannot be shared with others. But after communion, I am just member in the body. I am part of the whole body of Christ. It is time to rejoice together and experience the real strength. In Nehemiah chapter 8, we read, the joy of the Lord is your strength, and communion brings joy to our heart. Uh, as Abuna says after communion, our mouth is filled with joy and our tongues with gladness regarding our partaking of the body and blood of our Lord. Another spiritual exercise that's very important to experience the presence of God is service. And again, I'm speaking when the family, as a family, serve together in the same service. Maybe each one of you each member in the family, uh, each one uh, can 
uh, one person serve in the board, another in the uh, as a deacon, a third Sunday school servant. But here I'm speaking about serving together as a family. And one of the greatest challenges of the Christian life is to give our life in service to other under God's direction. But service to God is central to the Christian life. And also it, is, it plays an important role in developing spiritual intimacy within the family. Actually, there are many service projects that are informal. For example, as a family, you can visit hospitals and you can ask about sick people. As a family, you can visit uh, orphanages or foster homes and uh, or um, places for special needs. And you can actually, um, as a family, offer them uh, love and show them uh, hospitality. So we, we as a family should observe an opportunity and agree to make time and to exert the effort to do it together as a family. In such a service, you are not only growing spiritually as individual, but also the spiritual bond with one another will grow and the spiritual bond with the whole family of God will grow and the spiritual bond with the whole world will grow and this will enrich the rest of your life. Another important exercise is veneration of saints and again as a family, like in the story of Archangel Michael, how many families actually uh, commemorate the feast of Archangel Michael and they did charitable deeds uh, to the poor uh, during the feasts of Archangel Michael, like Aristarchus and Ephemia. So many families used to do certain celebrations in the commemoration of the saints. It is time to contemplate on their lives as a family. It is time to do charitable deeds in their names. It is time to experience the power of their intercessions and prayers. It's time to experience how the cloud of witnesses, as St. Paul mentioned in Hebrew chapter 12, the cloud of witness surrounding us and supporting us. It's also time to educate our children about saints and church fathers. These are our ancestors and uh, spiritual intimacy. We are not connecting uh, only with the people in our contemporary life, but as a body of Christ, we connect with every member in the body of Christ since Adam until now. That's why in, in Midnight Praises, we, we ask in the commemoration of the saints, prophets in the Old Testament, apostles, martyrs, um, anchorites, saints to intercede because we feel that we are one with the whole family of God from Adam until actually the end of ages. Uh, so we say in Psalm 150, praise God in all his saints. When we praise God in his saints, then we will feel the existence of God. As I told you in the beginning, God is omnipresent. God exists in our family. But many times we have this cloud that blinding our spiritual eyes. 
the purpose of all these spiritual exercises and other exercises that I did not mention today, the purpose of all these spiritual exercises is to remove this cloud from our eyes in order to be able to feel and to experience the existence of God. God with his angels were around Elisha, the prophet, but his disciple Gehazi could not see. He was spiritually blind. That's why Elisha prayed for him and asked the Lord to open the eyes of his uh, disciple Gehazi. So we need actually to ask God to open our eyes. Spiritual growth and intimacy is like anything else in our life. It takes time and commitment. It takes time and commitment. It is more about training than trying. As St. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 5, those who have their senses trained. So we need to train ourselves into these spiritual exercises. And then we will reap what we sow. All these are seeds, and we will reap the fruit of it and will experience the existence of God uh, among us. So when we reach the end of our life, I will not be focused on retirement plan or the uh, retirement plan or the kind of house uh, I am living in or what bank, my bank account will look like, but I will be interested in the right relationship with God and right relationship with the members of my family and the whole family of God. Uh, so, Doing relationship with an eternal perspective uh, is our goal. And if this is our goal, why not start sooner rather than later? Why don't start today? Today, if you hear his voice, we should not harden our hearts. And in this way, we will experience the existence of God in our midst. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Great, thank you very much, Sayedna. Um, so we've, we've had a few questions come in, some which are related to the talk and some which are general, uh, maybe parenting uh, questions. Um, I've categorized the questions in, um, I guess, certain categories. So, so one, of, one of the questions that related to um, the talk tonight, I might actually also paste it in the chat in case um, you would like to read it as I'm reading it too, Sayedna. Um, so the question is, Your Grace, these spiritual exercises are excellent, but how does one relay the spirit of these exercises to our children? For example, it is good to know him and rights, etc. But how about the spirit behind the him and the right? Thank you so much. The spirit actually is contagious in, uh, in a positive way. I mean by contagious, when actually we pray together, children are like the sponge. So they will absorb from me, not only the words that I am praying, but the spirit in which I am praying. Uh, if we see our children, we can see they are imitating us actually in, uh, in our, yeah, not only in our words, but they imitate us in our movement, in our body expressions. So our spirits, uh, 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 the children actually absorb from us even the spirit. When they see us praying with zeal, fervently, when they see us respecting and honoring the word of God and living by it, not in hypocrisy, but in integrity, the, the children actually, as I said, they are like sponge, they will absorb this from us. So just do it sincerely 
and don't worry, your children will learn from your example. That is a discipleship. Thank you, Sayyidina. Um, next question, just probably more about the exercises. How to encourage your teenager to attend virtual mass? Actually, mass is a Catholic term. We use the word liturgy. So how to encourage your teenager to attend virtual liturgy during lockdown? They are no longer interested. Uh, I understand attending the liturgy uh, virtually Definitely, it's not like attending the liturgy in person. So number one, let's pray and ask God to open the churches quickly so we can go and worship in the house of the Lord. But uh, I think teaching them about the importance of the liturgy in our life and how we cannot deprive ourselves from this is spiritual food and this is spiritual nourishment. Uh, and by our example, then actually they will be able to enjoy and attend the virtual uh, services in the church. Uh, I think not understanding the benefit and the effect and the role of the liturgy in our life is the main reason why you are not motivated to participate in it. Maybe another reason if they don't understand. For example, if you watch uh, a sport game like football or soccer and you don't understand the rules of the game, uh, you will not enjoy it. In the same way, understanding the liturgy is very important to enjoy the liturgy. So studying uh, liturgy, uh, rituals, and the meaning behind the rituals, this actually will help the teenager and the youth to be interested more in attending and participating the liturgies. Thank you, Sayyidina. So I think your comment about understanding the liturgy relates to two other questions about the Mass. So I might just uh, continue focusing on the Mass. So the next question is, um, I very much enjoy the Mass. However, as soon as they can start hymning Coptic hymns, I lose interest and feel separated from the Mass. Surely God is after our hearts and longing for us to connect with him instead of singing words without understanding. That's why sometimes there are uh, now many churches use only English. In America, we have uh, some churches, uh, we call it American Coptic Orthodox Church, in which actually we pray and we chant all hymns in English. And there is actually application called Coptic Hymns in English that has all the hymns in English, even the long hymns, how to be chanted in English. Uh, but if you are in a church that chanting uh, hymns in the Coptic language, don't be frustrated. Uh, thank God, actually, there is translation. And uh, you can follow the translation uh, and try to with the music of the hymn, try actually to pray in your heart with the understanding of, of the words. Uh, and this actually may give us opportunity to go outside our centeredness and to connect with others. In the book of Revelation, we hear from every tribe, every language, every tongue. So 
sometimes actually praying in different tongues give us this flavor. And heaven is, is multicultural. Heaven is not one culture uh, from every tongue, every tribe, every nation. Uh, some people, when they go to church, they go to church with this mindset. If they say something in Coptic or in Arabic, I'll be offended. Uh, that's why once they start to pray in, in Coptic or Arabic, immediately they are offended. But if I go, of course, I prefer to, to pray in my own uh, language, but I will do, uh, yeah, if they pray in different language, I will do the effort also to enjoy. This mindset will help you to enjoy the liturgy. And let me tell you, uh, me personally, because my first language is Arabic, uh, I enjoy praying the liturgy in Arabic and also in Coptic very much. But now, most of the time, I pray almost more than 95% of the liturgy in English. And uh, I am doing this also with joy, although that's not my first uh, preference, but I do it actually uh, for the sake of the people. Uh, so as those who speak Arabic or enjoy the Coptic, sometimes they go out of their comfort zone and pray in, in, in English. We have also to have this mindset. If they prayed in Coptic or in Arabic, uh, let me do the effort. And now thank God through application like Coptic leader, we have a translation for every single word it's chanted. So let's do the effort to enjoy the liturgy. Thank you, Sayyidina. I think we've got two comments relating to, um, I guess, the issue of Coptic hymns. So the first comment is, can you please share the link to the Coptic hymns? I think maybe they mean the link towards uh, the translation of the Coptic hymns. Is that Coptic reader, Sayyidina, or is it a different, a different No, language? no. Application called uh, Coptic hymns in English. Coptic hymns Coptic. in English. Uh, yeah, if, if you look at Apple Store or uh, uh, Android Store uh, and you write Coptic hymns in English, you will find this application. It's also by Southern Diocese. It has all the hymns in English, Coptic hymns in English. C-H-I-E, Coptic hymns in English, C-H-I-E. Great. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. And look, uh, I mean, your, your diocese Sayyidina, is, is very well known around the world of how active it is and especially doing such a great job to um, making so many of our church resources so accessible. So thank you for, for your hard work there. Um, the, the other comment was, um, if I may, as your grace mentioned, if we find out the spirituality behind the long hymns and have a contemplation, we will actually come to enjoy it. It is a mindset. I agree, yes, that's, I agree with this comment 100%. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So, Sayyidina, we've got a few parenting questions now. So the first parenting question is, how do you, how do you parent well when you and your partner are not on the same page about parenting because you have two very different parenting styles? My first advice is not to disagree with one another in front of your children. For example, if one uh, parent uh, dealt with the children in a certain way, the other should support the, uh, uh, the other parent in front of the children. And then th between them together, they can discuss the differences. Uh, supporting the other parent, even if I don't disagree, it will be in the benefit of the children rather than disagreeing in front of the children. Because once the children understand there is disagreement in parenting styles, they will take advantage of this. They will say, if you want to get yes, go to daddy. If you want to get no, go to mommy or the opposite, something like this. So we need actually uh, to be careful. Number two, we need actually to discuss our differences, the two different styles, and how to make them complement one another. And this needs uh, 
a lot of understanding, a lot of openness, a lot of com- complementing one another, um, and trying to reach an agreement for the best interest of the children. At the end, if we couldn't reach an agreement, uh, maybe we need uh, to go to an expert, uh, like a a Christian counselor uh, in our area or to Abuna and ask him to help us how to integrate our two different uh, parenting styles into a one parenting style that both of us can use together for the best interest of children. Great, thank you, Sayedna. Um, Sayedna, I've got probably about six different questions um, having the same theme. And basically the, the, the same theme running across all those questions is, what if one spouse is close to God, he or she, it's usually a she, um, is close to God, and then the other spouse is, is a bit far away from God? Um, the, the, this is one example of those questions, um, um, but I literally have six questions and some are, are huge questions. So if we could take this question as an example in the hope that it answers the other question as well. This question says, um, where a member of the family denies Christ and actively seeks to distance themselves from their family and responsibilities to their children or partner, seeking fun in the worldly sense, what can one do as they actively affect the perception of right and wrong by their kids? So, so the other question, yes. sorry, say that. go ahead. Definitely, this is a big challenge. Uh, I'm not denying this is a big challenge. And actually this uh, will make us see the importance of, of how to choose my spouse and my partner. We need to be very careful. Uh, in my opinion, uh, one of the most important decisions in our life is how to choose your partner or how to choose your spouse. Because a wrong choice can affect you and your children. Um, But again, as we said in the lecture, usually when we go to the scripture, we can find comfort and answer. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse verse 1, St. Peter said, wives, likewise be submissive to your own husband, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And actually, this verse can be applied also about husbands. We can say husbands, Likewise, likewise, love your wives, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their husbands when they observe your love and your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So if one spouse is away from Christ, away from the church, at least the other one should be faithful to God God, and faithful to uh, children and conduct his life in the right way. And here we have the promise from God in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be one by the conduct of their spouses. Praying also as San Monica prayed for Augustine. Praying uh, is very, very powerful uh, in our life. We need to pray and fast for the spouse who is away from God. And definitely we will reap what we saw. Great. Thank you, Sayyidina. Last question we have is... um, 
it's about multitasking and, and apologies for the other questions that we haven't gotten a chance to get to but it's, uh, it's getting to quarter to 10 here in Sydney so I want to make sure that um, we get to the questions as much as we can uh, the last question Sayedna is I want to be all in with my relationship with God however it's extremely hard to do that while trying to juggle work family and other hobbies I'm terrible at multitasking and my mind can only be one, sorry, on one thing at a time. How can we be all in but keep up with, with work, family and family commitments? One of the beautiful saying, it says, if you pray only when you pray, then you are not praying. What do I mean by this? The idea of separating my life, this is time for family, this is time for work, this is time for hobbies, this is time for God, is not actually biblical uh, principle. The biblical principle, as we read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So I have one life, and this life I'm living it to the glory of God. In my work, I am glorifying God. In my family, I'm glorifying God. In my hobbies, I'm glorifying God. In eating and drinking, I'm glorifying God. So the idea of just how to do multitasking, if I understand that, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. If we live, I live to Christ. And if we die, we die to Christ. So it's one life. So this struggle will be eliminated from our life. Second advice, time management. The power of time management. Unfortunately, many of us speak about time management, but very few who know how to budget their time effectively in order to be able to do these spiritual exercises, to attend faithfully to their work, to attend to their families. And let me give you an example. In any convention, you find in the convention, maybe you have liturgy every day, you have midnight praises every day, you have two or three lectures, then there is free time, you have time for Bible study, you have time for um, talent show, then how can we include all these activities in one day? There is a schedule, because there is a schedule. And following the schedule, make us achieve all these activities in one day. They speak about time management as if you are packing your luggage. If you are throwing items in your luggage, your luggage may be take four, five items. But if you actually start to pack and to put them next to each other carefully, then the bag actually may take 10 items or 12 items it's because now you are putting them in order next to each other. Time is like this. Time needs to be managed. I need actually to have a schedule to follow. When I have a schedule to follow, this actually will, will help us to uh, be highly productive uh, in, in, in our life. So my two advices here, number one, our life, you, cannot, you should not classify, this is for work, this is for studying, this is for family, no. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And the second point, the power of, uh, power of uh, time management. Uh, train yourself to manage your time properly, then you will find your productivity is very high. Great. Thank you very much, Saidna. And um, speaking of productivity, thank you for waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning to, to accommodate for, for the Sydney time. You're, you're always ever so efficient and you make the absolute best of your time. May, uh, God bless you, Sayedna, and thank you so much for extending you so your much. love towards, towards us.
Um, just thank you for all 250 attendees that we have with us. Um, I did put up a link just for your feedback. We'd love to get your feedback just even for our next sessions. Um, our next session is Monday the 11th with his uh, immense Archbishop Angelos from the UK. So we'll send you guys an SMS and an email just to uh, inform you of the link. Um, so please, um, you know, um, just uh, try try to complete that feedback form. And I might just pass on to Abuna, uh, Abuna Matthew just to, to conclude for us and maybe just have uh, words for Bishop Yusuf. Thank you, Abuna. Uh, thank you, Ruby. Uh, our uh, very dear and precious uh, Sayedna, on, on behalf of His Grace Bishop Daniel, on behalf of the Fathers of the Diocese of Sydney, together with the servants who prepared for this evening's forum, we would like to extend a very, very sincere and special thank you and appreciation to Your Grace for uh, enlightening us tonight with the uh, words of wisdom and uh, inspirational words which touches all our hearts and benefit to our families. We, we thank you for the incredible love that you continue to show to, uh, to us here, the Diocese of Sydney. We take this opportunity also to uh, wish your grace a very blessed and prosperous Coptic New Year and a, a joyful Feast of the Cross for next week. Uh, and um, to conduct these uh, conferences online is, is, uh, is wonderful and beneficial. However, we all look forward very much as uh, borders are open to welcome your grace down in Sydney again to enlighten us uh, and uplift us with a conference for young couples and young families. We would welcome that very, very much uh, uh, to be squeezed into a very, very uh, uh, heavy uh, schedule. Sayedna, we thank you. We ask you to always remember us in your prayers. And we look forward to being enlightened with your sermons, with your talks, with your applications. And uh, we all uh, are enlightened and are richer through uh, uh, consulting SUS Copts, whether it's for the Sunday School curriculums, Coptic Reader, and various uh, other applications. May our Lord Jesus Christ preserve your grace as a treasure for the Coptic Church uh, abroad. Pray for us always, absolve us, and uh, I invite you to, uh, to please conclude for us with prayer. So, Sayedna, when you're ready, you can lead us in prayer. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Lord, we thank you so much for sending your word to us. Make us not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Bless all your children who attended this meeting with us. And those also who couldn't attend, bless them with your heavenly and earthly blessings. Make all of us be united together in this spiritual bond, the bond of your love toward us. Hear us through the intercession of St. Mary, Mother of God, St. Mark the Evangelist, and all the saints, when we pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our day, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass in us. It is a condition, but there was a word. I like to, to thank His Grace Bishop Daniel and also Father Suriel and Father Matthew and all the fathers and all of you for allowing me and giving me this opportunity to be with you uh, tonight. May the Lord uh, bless you all and may we always hear uh, good news about. Uh, your beloved diocese. Finally, the grace of uh, love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, communion gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sayedna. And uh, just a final thank you to also to Miriam, our, our interpreter. Um, I'm sure you've helped a lot of uh, Arabic speakers with us today. So thank you, Miriam. Uh, but funny enough, she's not translating that part, but at least we all know that we're thanking you. <laughs> Thank you. Good Thank night. you very much. Good night, everybody.